two, one. Welcome to Sounding Point Podcast. My name is Joseph Christensen, and today I have with me the harpist Anna Maria Mendieta. Anna Maria is an international soloist, recording artist, and the principal harpist in the Sacramento Philharmonic and Opera. She freelances with all the major orchestras in the Bay Area and has been a, a collaborator in the Adventures in Music program of the San Francisco Symphony for years. Most recently, Anna Maria has toured the world with her special tango project, Tango del Cielo, which is a multimedia uh, live concert experience that includes dancers, film projection, visual storytelling, and of course, musicians, of whom I am honored to be a part. Last year, we traveled to British Columbia for the Victoria International Tango Festival back when live performances were possible. <laughs> As we release this podcast, Anna Maria has released her new album, Tango del Cielo, a project that has spanned several years and was produced by my friend and colleague in Quartet San Francisco, uh, Jeremy Cohen, So, and a, a previous guest on the podcast. So, Anna Maria, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's a pleasure. So, um, first and foremost, let's just start talking about your album, since this is the uh, the event of the moment, and something <laughs> I understand you've been working on for quite some time. So, uh, tell me about this album, and how it came into being. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. The album is called Tango del Cielo, which means Tango of Heaven. And it really has been years in the making, years in the making, but it's been actually a project close to my heart. And even though it's gone through lots of twists and turns, bumps and, and all kinds of surprises all along the road, it's really come out to be an incredible, incredible project. And so I'm so excited about it. It was released a week ago and already in its first week, it's been uh, on the, it's on the billboard charts as number two on the classical, classical crossover charts for its wow. first week of release. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's see, it began, actually the idea began back in 2007 and I was originally going to, um, we actually started recording some of the tracks with Quartet San Francisco and uh, that was back in 2007 when I was just beginning with the, the whole exploring harp with tango and and working on arrangements and, and it's it, uh, it actually at that time it was such a new concept, and uh, it, Jeremy was helping me with a lot of very cool ways to incorporate the harp, and um, I also was very lucky to meet fantastic musicians that were Piazzolla's own musicians. Um, Pablo Ziegler, who was Piazzolla's pianist for 10 years, and um, Daniel Benelli, who was another bandoneon player. Piazzolla was a bandoneon uh, player, and... Um, they were musicians of his own group and personal friends of his. And I was very lucky to be introduced to them. And as I, and with Pablo, he had just won the, the Grammy award for the best tango album. So he was like up at the top, <laughs> the king of tango, been there and done that for everything. But he, but this kind of project was very intriguing to him. And so when I explained what I was trying to do, um, he kindly took me under his wing and worked with me on how we can incorporate the harp into some of these arrangements. And the very first piece that we created together was Introduction al Angel, which is a piece that we play together in the show. It's a piece that's on featured on the album. And um, I remember as he was working on it, and and then he, he it was like a light bulb went off. I know it. I got it. I got it. This is how we do it. And he finished it. And when he finished it, he 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 said to me, "Okay, now you do go and do what no one else has done before." And that was that was our beautiful connection because that was what he had done with the piano when Piazzolla had died. Um, People, he wanted to continue with his music and his expression, and people would tell him, "Oh, you can't, you can't play tango music without the bandoneon. Can't be done." And uh, and he was determined to prove prove it, prove them wrong. He was determined to prove it, and to the point. So many years later, he won 
the tango, the best tango album, Grammy for best tango album. And for me, when I began the project, it was actually way back, even before 2004, when I just fell in love with Piazzolla's music. And I, I was just in, intrigued and, and mesmerized. And so I tried to get my hands on any arrangement, anything. I couldn't find anything for harp. And when I would go to the music stores or, or ask anyone, people would laugh at me. They actually would laugh at me. And they would say, harp, tango, come on, that's impossible. <laughs> You can't play you can't play tango music on the harp. It just can't <laughs> be done. It's too chromatic. It's too this, too that, whatever. And, and so, and I thought, okay, I'm going to do it myself. And so I started collecting all kinds of arrangements for other instruments, and then started creating my own for the harp. And I was determined. I was determined, driven, really because I love the music so much. It's incredibly passionate, so dramatic. It has a whole gamut. It encompasses a whole gamut of emotions all in the music. And what's fascinating with the music is that Piazzolla, which is why I love his music so much, is not only does he use the instrument as a melodic instrument, but he uses the instrument as a percussive instrument and drawing forth so many different creative sound effects from the instruments. And so that's what I ended up trying to do with the harp and trying to mimic some of the char characteristic sound effects that the other instruments would create was a, was a challenge for me to try to figure that, how to do that on the harp. And so, yes, it was many, many years in the process. And, uh, and I, I should mention back in 2007, when I, um, actually it was 2006 and Jeremy played with me, we were featured at the um, National Harp Conference of the American Harp Society. In a way, it was premiering this kind of concept. And Jeremy and his quartet, San Francisco, yeah, so Jeremy was there from the very beginning. And, uh, and it was a very exciting moment to be able to premiere this concept. And it was well received. And one thing led to another and a film company started following the project, following the, the growth of the project with the idea of creating a documentary of it. And as one thing led to another, I was introduced to more composers and more projects. And, and so then we went into the recording studio 2007 to start to record the tracks. And um, actually it could have been 2006, sorry about that. It's been so long. And, and, but what happened was uh, I got into a car accident, actually, a huge car accident, major. The car was totaled. The harp was totaled. Wow. I had a compression neck fracture. I could mm. barely I could barely move my hands, barely open and close my fingers. And yeah, so everything came to a stop, complete halt, mm -hmm. complete. And so at the time, as I was trying to heal, I would still continue to play little by little, maybe with one hand and, and continue to with jobs even as, as it just, I really, God saw me through that very challenging time. But um, the show had to, had to change because no longer could I dance as a part of the show because that was actually to learn about harp, to learn about tango, I started taking tango lessons to, to really understand the music. And But when I couldn't dance as a part of the show and we needed to have some dance, that's when we added flamenco so that we could in, in, include the dance element and continue with the dance element. And that's if the flamenco ended up being a perfect match, really beautifully well-suited with the tango. The tango music's very moody and inward and deep and the, and the flamenco is very fiery and dramatic and 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 showy and they really do complement each other very well. And so that's actually how that addition had happened. And then as the years progressed and I was able to, to get, it took years to get back to, to the level of playing that I was, that I was at before. And, but through that whole, through that time, um, there were more arrangements created. I started uh, soloing with this music with orchestras, uh, it, it, it just expanded, expanded to a much, much bigger, bigger project. And so in 2015, we began uh, um, recording for the very first tracks with the orchestra at Skywalker. 
Many of these arrangements are arrangements by Jeremy Cohen, and they're incredible arrangements. Jeremy's playing his solo violin in many in many special spots on the on the or, on the uh, album, and we've incorporated the other arrangements too by Pablo Siegler. Um, we were and, and another arrangement by Jorge Calandrelli, which that's a great story too. <laughs> I'd love to share the, too at, at some point. So it that's. That's when it began, 2015, with the orchestra tracks. And because of COVID, when the when my concerts were canceled, it was just a few days before the uh, announcement, the public announcement, that I, I got the news from San Francisco Symphony that our outreach concerts were canceled. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with these few days? <laughs> All this time on my hands I'm not used to because I was actually performing concerts every day. And so I thought, okay, something pushed me to go back into the recording studio and just finish those final touches, final things. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. And just like the, just a couple days after, that's when the public announcement of the shutdown happened. And it, and with that time, I got to work with the the engineer. We got to edit and mix the tracks. It gave us that time to complete the album. And as I was sharing the tracks with a composer in Spain, she said, well, she called me up immediately from Spain and uh, she's, she's composing music for me for a, another concert with an orchestra. And I was, I said, well, if you're working on that now, maybe I can include it on this album. And she said, well, send me the tracks to the album. So I sent it to her. Her name is Claudia Montero. And she called me up right away from Spain. And she says, I love the album. I love what you're doing. I want to support you. I want to support your album. I want to recommend it. I want to submit it to Latin Grammys. I was like, uh, oh, really? Wow. Whoa. And then, oh. but she says, but you got to finish it in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so we rushed to race to get it all done. And we submitted it. And actually we submitted it on time. But the distribution company couldn't do the turnaround uh, mm. quick enough for the actual release deadline to qualify. And there were other factors, too, that came into play that it just was really the best thing for us to do was to withdraw. We're going to they gave us uh, the they said that we can submit next year. Yeah, We're in good right. standing. Everything's fine. In the meantime, um, one of the composers, Jorge Calandrelli, uh, wanted to submit this for American Grammys. And so that then became a whole nother journey. And as he put it, get it into a package state. Take, you know, take the time to put it into a beautiful package, make that CD, then present it. And that's what we did. We finished the whole thing again, just with those deadlines. If we didn't have those deadlines, it wouldn't have happened. And then mm -hmm. the, the beautiful thing is, is that once he, once all the submissions got in, guess what I found out in order to qualify the, you're only allowed five years of a time span from the beginning, from the very first recording session, which was 2015 to five years to the release date. And that's this year. So I oh didn't know gosh. it, but this is <laughs> the last year. Yeah that we could have even been able to submit. So uh, that's amazing. thank you. Thank you, God. That's yeah. <laughs> how things worked. Yeah. Amazing. Well, that's, uh, that's Providence right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. That's, I um, am extremely excited that it's gotten on the billboard charts already. And I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes from here. So sounds like it's in the running. Thank you so much. We're so excited. So, so yeah, it, it it sounds like you, even though the recordings happened about five years ago, the generation of this idea happened much longer ago, like 2006, 2007. Even and before that, yeah. Before that. Mm -hmm. And that is an amazing uh, story of just like perseverance, I would say. Mm -hmm. Not only, you know... Um, not only following through with an idea like that, but also the fact that you had an accident in the middle and that changed the whole way that the live show went, which I didn't even know as part yeah, of the performance. Nobody, I didn't, knows. <laughs> I nobody didn't even knows. know that 
but um, I'm glad you're okay now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. But um, yeah, so it's, that's an amazing uh, story of perseverance. Mm-hmm. So um, I think what's interesting is, um, is that first of all, that you, you persevered through that long and I always have this question as an artist um, doing a project, and that is, how much did you know when you started? <laughs> did you have a end goal in mind of how it was going to be? Did it look anything like it is right now? Wow. You know, that's a great question. No, I had no idea it was going to develop to, to this. All I knew is that I loved the music. I was passionate about the music, and I wanted to explore it more, and I was driven and yeah, I can't explain it. It was, it was just being driven from inside to keep continue exploring and to make it work. And so, and I love a challenge. So yes, that's, that's what was my motivation. So yes, working with the different composers and, and in order to learn the music better or understand the music better, since it's about dance, that's why I started studying tango dancing but luckily, my family is all into dancing. We're all dancers anyway, so it was it was an easy thing to do. But I did go to um, Argentina, Buenos Aires, to study too with musicians there, because as and and Jeremy would say this too: you can't play tango music just as it's written on the page. It it isn't the same. It isn't. It's a uh, you have to really listen to the music enough and really be immersed in the music. And that's what was so eye-opening for me, to be in Argentina, and now I've gone many times, but to be in Buenos Aires to to work with the musicians, to play with the musicians, it's a totally different thing. You hear things differently. You um, th- Then that's when you can really basically just totally envelop yourself in the music, immerse yourself completely in the music to understand it. And so that was an incredible experience. I, th- um, I It's funny. I, I have two things I want to ask. So let me, which one should I do first? Um, <laughs> I'll start with, um, I think I was going to ask you one of the kind of just general questions I had in this interview was I wanted to ask you how you follow through or like what your advice would be as I would say a musical entrepreneur as someone who has started something and followed a project through from, you know, beginnings all the way to this culmination. And it's incredibly, um, incredibly (laughs) perseverance, perseverant, (laughs) is that a word way? But I think you already answered it partly when you talked about how you didn't have the end goal in mind as much as you had the passion for the music itself. So maybe that would be a good uh, starting point to say that as a musician, if you have a project, if you have something you want to accomplish, it has to first be preceded by the passion for that music. Yes, I totally agree with you. It has to start from within. That passion would be your your motivation, your drive. And then uh, with whatever it is that you're pursuing, to learn as much as you can about that subject. Um, uh, when I went to Buenos Aires, the, the very first lesson that I had with my teacher, his name was Javier Cohen, which he was from uh, uh, a very famous music school in Buenos Aires. And when, he, when we started, he actually went way to the beginning of the very roots of tango and talking about the history and the, the different, the, just the whole transition from composers to styles. And it's all a part of the 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 music it's all a part of the understanding and how you can really um totally sink yourself into that uh, to be able to express or understand how to express the music in the best way to understand mm-hmm. the full history of it i think is important right so you totally immersed yourself in immersed it immersed yourself and and um i was going to ask about tango in general i um i have with you and with jeremy i've gotten more kind of exposure to tango than ever before in my life and i've been lucky to have as my you know as my uh, initiators into tango you and jeremy who have so much experience and so much background in it and also uh i gotta shout out uh 
uh, Sasha Jacobson and uh, Charles Krasinski also for um, for uh, initiating me into the ways of tango. And uh, it's been a really interesting thing. I, I wanted to ask your um, opinion. I mean, as someone who's gotten the opportunity to play a little more um, just in the last couple of years, and it's still, I'm, I mean, very much an outsider. I, um, I'm, I'm starting to get a feel for it and get a feel of the push and pull in it, but I w- I'm still very much a novice at it. I think it's fascinating to me there there's almost a parallel in tango between the there's this extremely strict rhythmic aspect that has to do with the dance right this very dry rhythmic drive that undergirds a lot of tango and at the same time this extremely sinuous free kind of mysterious um way of playing the melodies and certain amounts so to me tango as much as i understand it is like this interplay between this absolutely rigid structure and this incredibly sort of intuitive um impulsive thing on um with with the music and i i find almost there's a parallel that i find interesting as an outsider where tango at any time you hear someone discuss it it's almost in a um there's a maybe not a conflict but there's always a discussion of the old school versus the news like there's like the old the diehard tango people who are like tango must be this way <laughs> and they're like it can only have this and this and you only can have these instruments you know and there's that side of it very conservative very almost reactionary and then even you know, piazzola right he had the nuevo tango he had this new style of tango that was very like controversial even back then that he was adding this new stuff and and it, it just struck me as interesting when you were talking about oh we cannot have have harp and tango you know <laughs> it's, it's it's like always this interesting reactionary element to it but it's but that's somehow also playing off this you know this extreme freedom and interpretation and and um and the and the flexibility that it actually does have to include things like the nuevo tango and and uh, Pablo Ziegler with the piano and you with the harp. So anyway, I just wanted to see if what you had to say about that. Well, you're right on about about all of that. Yes, there's got to be this very strict tempo and structure that's a part of the the the, the base, and and that's very very important. And this is very similar to the dancing as well. So just as the dancers are are literally they're barely touching each other, but they're balanced together with each other. And so if anyone is pushing too much, pushing in either way, then it can't work. But together as a team, they are also grounded, very much grounded in the rhythm, grounded in the, in, in solidly with the rhythm, but it's allowing also there's freedom for them to uh, interpret the music in very creative ways. And so it's a matter of being a, 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 a real sensitive listener, listening to the partner, listening just like a musician. Musicians are dancing with each other when they're performing tango music, having to listen very carefully and to respond. So it's, a, it's a, just like the dance. It's a lead and follow relationship. But together, a communication and cooperation together, it's the same thing with the music. Um, but that is, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. It's, it's so much a combination of the two. Yeah. And can you talk about your, um, maybe some of the resistance that you met with, like in people maybe not thinking that it was appropriate to have a harp or whatever. And then you, like, mm-hmm. but also this great support from people like Pablo Ziegler. Yeah. Oh, no, there's been wonderful support. Very, very much so. Um, Yeah, in the beginning, in the beginning, it was very much, yeah, it would be a a kind of like a chuckle, uh, the response would be a chuckle. (laughs) Yeah. Harp and tango, (laughs) I've never, never related the two. So, yeah, but um, the, as Pablo would say, do you, you can play jazz on any instrument. And why not play, be able to play tango on any instrument? Mm-hmm. And so I think, too, with Piazzolla, stretching the envelope of what the, the tango form originally 
was the traditional tango was very much a, 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 an expected form. And so when he stretched the envelope to, and he related, he basically brought in jazz elements and modern classical elements, and he really kept stretching the envelope, stretching the envelope. And as the story goes, he was not accepted in his own country. Mm -hmm. He, he, it really was the rest of the world who loved his music that after Argentina could see that, then they welcomed him back and to the point where he is one of the most beloved composers and the government even would pay then for him to compose and perform in the, in the public square every weekend. So that's, that was the huge turnaround. Yes. Um, when I went to Argentina, um, it's very interesting. There, there is a division between the, the tango musicians and the classical musicians and I think what probably helped so much was that I had already worked with so many very important, very prominent uh, composers in the mm -hmm. genre already before I went there. And that I think was very, very important, extremely for, and they wel welcomed me so warmly. I'm so mm -hmm. grateful. I see. So you had some of that, um, some of that pedigree, tango pedigree when you went there um, and, uh, <laughs> very cool that people have been open to open to yeah embracing my vision i um wanted to ask about some of the people you got to work with so like um just yeah pablo ziegler did he have stories about working with piazzola and what was that like working with him oh you know um with the angel piece with the introduction ellen hell he told me that um that piece was actually never written down by Piazzolla. He never wrote it down, but they would perform it together as a group and, and you know, many, many, many times and tour with it. And then it was after Piazzolla had died, Pablo wrote down the music the way he remembered uh, Piazzolla having played it. So mm -hmm. that, that's what he told me and that um, he originally created an arrangement for himself to play with the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, which is beautiful. And that's how I first heard of the piece. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a fascinating thing to learn that it really wasn't written down. And so he was really basically creating it by memory. Um, wow. Jorge, Jorge Calandrelli is another uh, composer on the album. Um, Jorge is a fantastic, fantastic uh, composer, arranger. He's both of them, both Pablo and Jorge are multi-Grammy award winners. Um, Jorge Calandrelli uh, also was, has been nominated for Academy Awards. He's got <laughs> 28 Grammy nominations, many, many Grammy awards. He's just like, wow. Uh, well, he told me this. Uh, he's the arranger for Oblivion in, on the album. Oblivion mm -hmm. is a piece by Piazzolla. It's a, one of his most famous pieces. It's really incredibly beautiful. And um, we were, when I, uh, he, how, how do I begin? Gosh, it's, it's just an incredible story. So he was kind enough to come up to Skywalker to conduct the orchestra. We were there in the recording session, ready to begin the piece. And he, he put up his baton and then it was like, he, he waited a, a moment and he, and he said, I need to tell you a story. And he said, and he explained that um, he looked, Piazzolla had asked him to create an orchestration of Oblivion way back when. And, um, and this is when Jorge was just a budding composer and he looked up to Piazzolla as his mentor. And so he felt so honored to be asked to create this orchestration. So they went, they actually were recording it with the Royal Philharmonic in London. And they were in the middle of the recording session when they got the call that Piazzolla had suddenly died. And, and with that production stopped and Jorge then composed a beautiful interlude as a tribute to Piazzolla. So he inserted that in the middle of the piece they went back into the recording studio, they re-recorded the piece, and that piece, that arrangement was what won Piazzolla his very first Grammy Award. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. And so Jorge was so excited that now, 25 years later, we were re-recording this piece. Now, differently, though, with the harp 
as the main voice in the original arrangements with an oboe as the main voice. But he recreated the arrangement to have the harp as the main voice. And he, he composed a beautiful introduction, brand new, fresh introduction to it, which is lovely. And so 25 years later, to be able to represent this beautiful, beautiful work, it, it's so exciting. So that's what's on the album. And we're very, very, very proud of it. Very excited about it. Fantastic. Wow. That's, um, we knew we were so cool that, history. yeah, you have this direct connection with the history. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Um, where can, oh, you know, I, what can listeners expect when they listen to your album? Okay. It's definitely a, a journey. It ha- the album is with harp and a lush orchestra. It's very dynamic. That's the nature of tango music, just really passionate, dynamic. It's full of a lot of energy. So they'll, they'll experience that energy, that sparkle. And then there are moments, too, where it's very deep and moody and inward. And so it's got, got both the, the gamut of emotions on the album. And I think um, the best way to describe it, it's, it's a journey. It's a, it's an incredible journey. Well, it's been an incredible journey playing the <laughs> show, some uh, interpretation of this album with you and, and with the group. So it's been it's great. Been, and I'm been great really having you. Yeah. <laughs> so much fun. It's, yeah. I hope we can get back out there at some point. Yeah. Do some, yeah. do some live uh, concerts. Miss those. I know. So, and where, so where can they find the album? Okay. The album has, it's on, it's got its own website. The album is called Tango del Cielo. So you can go to tangodelcielo.com and I'll just spell that out for you. Tango, T-A-N-G-O, del, D-E-L, cielo, which is C-I-E-L-O. So tangodelcielo.com. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And we can put the link in the description and everything too. And it'll be right there. Fantastic. And good. So. I mean, that's a good segue of, I mean, it's been the topic of the, it's been the to- all the rage to talk about. <laughs> how, how have you been dealing with this pandemic? How's it kind of affected you? Well, you know, it's opened up to a lot of other areas that I didn't expect would happen. So I'm very grateful for this time that I got to finish the album and complete that. But um, what's also happening is a streaming service, a streaming channel and resource network service. It's quite quite amazing how it's expanded. Um, in the beginning, uh, before the pandemic even happened, actually, I was looking at, at having a streaming channel on our site. So for when we had performances, for those who couldn't make it to the concerts, they'd be able to enjoy the concert live uh, through the streaming. Um, but so we had already started looking into that last year the and during the fall. But when the pandemic happened, I realized really this needs to be shared with others and other musicians, other performers. And I got the license. I already had the licenses with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. It was all, everything was already in place. So as I started talking with others, it's really blossomed and, and grown to an incredible, incredible, beautiful project, really a network project of many, many artists together, working together, musicians, filmmakers, sound engineers, um, actors, uh, theaters, uh, and even orchestras and concert presenters are, are involved too, and managers and agents and, and uh, attorney. So we've got, we've got so many that now are on the board as a group, com- as a community to put this uh, forth. And it would be a streaming service called uh, Passport M, Passport M meaning for music, multimedia, multidisciplinary, and um, it will have different divisions of a concert, live concerts or pre-recorded concerts, view on demand, online learning, uh, the, 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 let's see, downloadables, all, all kinds, oh, also private, private concerts and videograms. It's got so many different divisions, but it's to be as a resource for 
all of us performers and in the entertainment industry to be able to help each other. So the whole thing has expanded to such a, such an enormous project. Um, I, uh, I've even been offered a, a multimedia international multimedia network to help launch this. And so it's, it's really incredible. And the whole purpose is to help everyone to enter, earn an income again, get out and perform again and, and engage with their audiences, engage with their, their patrons. And it's so important to keep that, that connection going and allow for music and the arts to do what it was intended to do to uplift society. That's mm. what's so important right now, more than ever, we need the arts. We need that. We need to give and, and the, the, and the community um, it all needs to, to all be connected in this way. So that's important. It's already difficult as a musician. You have to be quite creative in order to find a way to make your, your activity financially feasible. And now it's more difficult than ever. And that's how, I mean, that's how I understand this project. And, and when you first talked to, when we first talked about it, it struck me that it's like, oh, you know, this this aims at kind of addressing some of the fundamental problems that musicians are having right now in terms of connecting what they do and and being able to support it. So just I'm curious um, because it covers so many things. <laughs> it, might be, it might be it might be helpful to break it down a little bit and see. Um, almost the problems that it addresses. So first of all, you mentioned that it has licenses from ASCAP and all these That's different right. organizations. Could you talk about what what is the importance for musicians to have those as they stream very performances? Important. Exactly. It's very, very important. Just, just as if any musician is performing another person's work, another composer's uh, creative content or arrangement, they, that is... Um, in, just as a theater needs to pay a license fee to these uh, to the organizations that are um, basically protecting the creator of this content, we have to do the same thing as uh, a live stream organization, a live stream business. We have to make sure that everyone's protected: the composers, the creators, the 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 creator, original creators of the content. But for streaming. The licenses are only allowed for the actual live stream or for within 40, 48 hours of that original live stream. After that, it goes into a different category where we do need to also um, uh, obtain the permissions for, for everything. And I'm also, so I'm working with an attorney on that. I'm also working with the musicians union so that everybody's protected. We need mm -hmm. to make sure that, and the unions are very, very interested. We want to make sure that everything is, is taken care of. The musicians are protected, the copyrights are protected. And, um, but it is new territory for everyone. So that's yeah. why it's a, uh, it's a huge undertaking, but with a, a good purpose, everybody wants the same outcome for everyone. So we're, we're working on this together. One thing we've talked about on this podcast before several times is um, is just kind of advocating new music, like making sure that composers and creators have the same opportunities and, and better opportunities in the future to create and to distribute their music. And it strikes me that um, obviously this um, these licenses are needed for new music. You, you know, you don't have to obtain a license for Mozart. <laughs> no. <laughs> because it's public domain. No. So... So, but so this, in a way, is really important for um, not only composers but people who want to support new music and, so, and perform new music. That they're able to do it in a way that is sustainable. That the composer can benefit from their work being performed, and then the musicians don't feel constrained. Oh, I can't play anything that's not public domain or doesn't have these weird limitations on it. So I think that. It's, it doesn't come immediately to mind when we talk about, you know, forwarding new music and, and getting more good composers and new voices out there. But it seems like a really important thing. So it's great you're doing that. Very important thing. And everybody needs to be honored. The, the, the creator of the content, the performer of the content, everybody needs to be honored and respected. And, and so that's, that's, that's the goal. That's what great. we're trying to do. It's amazing. And then um, 
okay, so there's the the licensing aspect of it, and then um, it's going to have so many different kinds of um, media on it, right? So, yeah. so can you talk a little bit about um, what you're expecting to do with a live stream and like how is there archived content on there? How does it work? Yes, there will be archived concert content as well. And so um, I, the, since they will have uh, different divisions, uh, the archive content will be uh, available and accessible for everyone. That's important, really important that there's also this educational division as mm -hmm. a part of this uh, channel. And so um, the, I can't give too much information out just yet because that's still in development and we have a very special person who's, who's got his connections with, 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 with the archive content in Europe too for, so it's going to be really exciting. So, but I can't disclose too much just yet because it's still in development. You keep your secrets then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exciting. That's very cool. Um, so there's going to be that. Um, there's going to be, some archive content. There's going to be an educational aspect of it as well. Um, any other, um, any other facets of this organization you want to talk about specifically? Um, well, yes, that uh, with each transaction. Um, so the, the whole purpose is so that it would be uh, either free or of very little uh, uh, pay from the actual performer. We're trying to make it so that it's free for the performer and that the viewer is then um, paying for the, for the service. Yeah. But for every transaction, a percentage is going to be pulled out for outreach to be able to offer the same services to those who are in hospitals and in the care facilities and to schools. And um, especially during now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, those who are in the hospitals can't even be visited by their own family members. So this is very, very important to be able to allow for a connection between them and their family. So for those recipients of the outreach, they'll be able to put their own concerts together, basically like being the director's chair of mm -hmm. programming. And so that way, putting their energy, their, their attention and energy into something creative and then to be enjoyed with the whole family, with their family and friends together and a way of being united in that way. So that's really important that I need to mention because it is very much connected to outreach as well. Mm -hmm. With each transaction, there's a percentage that goes to, to that. That's really for cool. that purpose. That's very, it's very wide ranging, you know, mm -hmm. it's almost, well, even when you, you uh, described it um, over the phone, I was like, and there's this, and there's this, and there's this, <laughs> right, <laughs> like, hey, this is intense. I mean, it's, it, but it's it all like intense. needed. It's really cool how much thought's gone into it. Well, thank you. And I really have to share the, the, it's been a big group that e it's just gotten bigger and bigger and everybody has been able to add their talents, add their ideas to it. And so it's really a, a, an effort of so many people's wonderful, wonderful ideas and, and uh, intentions. And so mm -hmm. it's with a good purpose in mind. And the same thing, it's a network for everybody it, to, to be together. And where can people find this? Or is it, it does okay. it have an online presence yet? Or? It will, it will. It's going to be under pa passportm.com. So that uh, should be up. Actually, okay. this is in September, so later this month. Great. We're okay. really, really close, like just a few weeks away. Exciting. Well, I'll be sure to, to put that out on social media when, when the time arises. Right. Wonderful. Well, before we leave, I, I thought it would be fun to just kind of um, learn about your upbringing and kind of some of, like, how did you get into HARP? What were, what were some of your teachers growing up? And some things you've learned along the way to pass along to the any okay. aspiring harpists out there. Thank you so much. Well, um, how did I start with the harp? I was five years old when I knew I wanted to play the harp. Uh, both of my parents were musicians, so we were raised listening to classical music in the house. And um, I remember my father would collect all kinds of instruments. He, In fact, he would take great pride that he would have so many instruments in the house. But the one instrument we didn't have was the harp. And that's why I wanted to play it. Because I knew <laughs> it was the one you didn't have. <laughs> the one we didn't have. Yeah. 
Well, actually, it was either that or the bagpipes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Good choice. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I love the bagpipes. I go on the bagpipes. I don't think <laughs> That's the next big uh, Nuevo, the Nuevo next tango. Big, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. But um, so, yes, I was five years old, but it threw them for a loop. So they had me start on the piano to, to just keep me busy. And they said that I pestered them. And so I guess I just pestered them for two years. And I started when I was seven years old. And I just knew, I knew that's what I wanted to do. There was no question about it. Absolutely no question. I just knew this is what I wanted to do. I'm so grateful. And I had very good teachers. I started at the Conservatory of Music in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you you recently posted a um a picture of the is it the Camden seminars the um the harp oh, seminar right, right. so uh, and was that with Alice Shalafu? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. In what was Maine. that like? Oh my gosh, she was incredible. Okay, in Maine there is a special harp colony called the Salzedo Summer Harp Colony colony, and it's in Camden, Maine where harpists would go to study with Alice Shalafu. Alice Shalafu was a student of Salzedo, Carlos Salzedo, who was one of the prominent harpists of the 20th century. And uh, he developed his, not only was he a composer, but developed his whole technique of playing and uh, had quite, quite the the school um, in Campton. And so Alice Shalafu took over after he had passed away and took over the school and, and, uh, continued with it. So yes, when I, uh, I so appreciated studying with her. She lived to be 97 and um, she had, she wouldn't, we had to attend lessons in a dress and high heels. That's, she was very strict. It was so funny. And wow. we were not allowed to, to do any kind of sports, anything mm-hmm. that would damage or endanger our hands at all. And I remember one time uh, my, uh, friend, roommate, housemate, actually, um, who was also a harpist. We, we once played hooky and went bicycle riding to the <laughs> beach. It was like, oh, we can't <laughs> <have> one. <laughs> it was so funny. Were you found out? No, no. We oh, didn't. wow. Under the, under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But it was a, such a fantastic, the whole experience there, to be surrounded with harpists and music and to, to have her, her guidance was really incredible, have her teaching. Wonderful. Thanks. So uh, thank you so much for your time. It was great catching up. I mean, this podcast is, you know, everyone's had their quarantine project. You've had these epic ones. This has been my little humble contribution to start my little podcast. And uh, it's been a, it's been a great opportunity to catch up with friends and people I haven't seen in a long time as, as well as to uh, provide a little signal to what they're doing. So thank you so much for coming on. It's great to see you. Thank you. you. Thank you, Joseph. Congratulations to you on your podcast. This is fantastic. Thank Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Everyone go check out Tango Del Cielo and, um, and Passport M. All right. All right. Thanks so much. Have a fantastic rest of your day and week and life. I'll see you soon.